Good evening. Good evening. Our apologies for the delay. Welcome to this evening's school board meeting of December 8th, 2015. Would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Yeah, very good. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, our first item on this evening's agenda is to ask if there are any adjustments to the agenda. Do we have any requests for adjustments to the agenda? Move items around? Nope. Are you sure? Yep. Okay, seeing none. <laughs> Item number two, approval of school board minutes. Uh, I move that we approve the school board minutes from the executive session Tuesday, November 17th, the regular business meeting Tuesday, November 17th, and the workshop Tuesday, November 17th. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Item number three, comments from student representative. Okay. Um, so let's see, we're, we're like a good portion into the um, second quarter at the high school. Um, and I know that the fall, uh, the, sorry, the winter athletic season is just starting. So that's where Montana just went to her basketball game. Um, but there was, I think we've had the first swim meet, we've had the first hockey game, the basketball teams have had their first games already. Um, so that's picking up. We only have two more weeks till Christmas break, which is really nice. Um, and then once we get back from winter break, we're going to have um, Winterfest, I think, in mid-late January. Um, so that'll be good to look forward to um, once we get back so we don't have to just focus solely on midterms, which are coming up when we get back from Christmas break. Um, let's see, also for the seniors, for anyone who applied early decision to college, they're going to be hearing back probably within the next week. So that's really a lot of angst, but it's fine. Um, so. Yeah, um, I think we have probably eight or nine people who know where they're going to school already, which is really great. Um, we have a senior class Facebook page um, where our class president, Alex Mukai, is like posting a little shout out on the Facebook page for everybody who gets into college, um, which is really fun to see. Um, so that's really exciting. But uh, yeah. Good times. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, Item number four, comments from the public on agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Um, item number five, communications. Um, we have a few special presentations from this evening. Um, item 5A is the Extended Learning Opportunities Program. So John Holdridge, who's been coordinating that program, he's our ELO and volunteer coordinator, is going to introduce the students, some of the students who are here with him tonight and give you a little overview of that program. And just to be clear, ELO is not the Electric Light Orchestra. To be clear. To be clear. Hi. Thanks for having us here. We're happy to be presenting. So I'm, uh, I'm standing here now. Um, I'm going to set the stage. Um, and uh, I'm also here with my... Uh, some collaborators and I think co-founders of the, of the program for teachers and students. Oh, thanks. Um, and you'll have a chance to hear maybe more from them and ask questions later. I'm here with Ben Raymond, Stephen uh, Bennett, and Dylan Provo. Stephen and Dylan are both seniors at at Cape, and they're they're members of the Student Driven Learning Project. And Dylan also spends half his time at PATS. Uh, and, and you can ask them questions in a minute. So I'm gonna I'm gonna set the stage here, if, if all of this works. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a, a brief history of student-driven learning. Um, and I'm, uh, and it, it's a short history because this program is in its pilot year. But last year, I'm going to just kind of let you know how it, how it all came about. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to actually ask your assistants to bring all of the students' voices into the chamber. And then we'll uh, introduce Stephen and, and um, Dylan. And you can ask them some questions, and they can talk about it. So last year, I think maybe in about May, uh, Ben Raymond uh, put out an email to the staff at Cape Elizabeth High School asking if anybody wanted to simply have a conversation about different or new ways that we could engage our students. 
What came out of that is a group of us went to visit Baxter Academy in Portland um, to observe their Fletch Friday program. If you don't know about that, Fletch Friday is a, every Friday at Baxter all year long students is dedicated to student independent projects and we were kind of wowed by the energy that was there um, and we came back and, and talked to Jeff Shedd and he gave us permission to design a pilot program for 10 students. This was all happening as, as the school year was rolling for close and people were studying for exams. Um, we invited all rising juniors and seniors to apply. We got about 20 applications, and we narrowed that down to 10 students who were then notified that they would be in the program this year. And then guidance um, was very helpful in building those schedules, including that. So the students who are in the program, um, the student-driven learning is part of their full load. They have a dedicated uh, period in the rotation that is for their work, um, and they're receiving uh, general education credits for that work. So that was in the spring of 2.15 in the fall, this year in September, uh, we launched Student Driven Learning at um, Elizabeth High School. We have 10 students working on eight projects. There are two uh, partnerships. They both happen to be filmmaking partnerships. So we have helicopter design and engineering, playwriting, neuroscience, teaching, analytics, big data, and professional football, filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, and entrepreneurship and e-commerce. Students in the program are retired to plan and manage their time um, and their own projects. They're uh, asked to check in with their advisors, myself and Ben Raymond, and community mentors when they have them and as, as those partnerships develop. Uh, we ask them to meet as a cohort and to report to and support their peers in the program. Uh, to develop presentations for advisory groups to represent and promote the program, to work collaboratively with peers and with their advisors to help us develop the program so we can continue and make it bigger and better and faster and stronger, and also to think and write reflectively. And this is where I'm going to actually ask all of you to help me out, because recently we did a little bit of reflective writing, and we have two students with us today, but they are representing the entire program. And we did a little uh, reflective writing, and we were asked the questions that are on the board up there. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, bring these voices and comments to life. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, where's Montana? She'll be back. She'll be back. Yeah. We'll see. If she doesn't get here, uh, maybe you can read both of them if she doesn't get okay. back. Okay. <laughs> so as, as part of our most recent writing assignment, uh, we asked students uh, two questions. What have been the most productive learning experiences of student-driven learning so far, and what is the value of the student-driven learning model? Um, and I'm going to reflect those quotes, and I'll, we'll start it this way. If they're all in order, uh, we'll have the first one with John is uh, reading from Wyatt. Wyatt said the value of the student-driven learning model is its openness to a wide variety of projects. It allows for a broad array of projects and enables us to actually achieve our goals. Next, Rose. The biggest value is in allowing students to somewhat teach themselves. Although we have lots of help from advisors, the day-to-day -day work is on us. The SDL program requires a great deal of independence as someone is not constantly keeping tabs on you. This is, not, this is, excuse me, I corrected the grammar. This acquired independence will serve us well in all other aspects of school and life. Um, and Dylan said, answered, the most productive learning experience I have had so far took place when I began to look into engines for my helicopter. I changed my mind dozens of times and in the end learned a massive amount about the drivetrain, engine, and rotors of a helicopter. Gabby says, from creating a project on my own and running the classes on my own, I'm learning how to manage my time, work with others, do something that interests me, and learning how to make a documentary. The model has forced me to work with others and to self-motivate myself to do work every day. I have to be the one to decide what I need to do to be productive. And then Nat Jordan writes, uh, most productive learning experience so far in SDL has been more the accumulation of raw skills than the accumulation of knowledge about my topic. I've learned how to navigate spreadsheets, specifically Google Sheets, and reinforced my knowledge of statistics and concepts. I've learned how to plan, organize, and develop my project before doing the actual work. 
Sarah's interest is in neuro neuroscience. I really enjoy the SBL model because it supplies you with the community, which has been one of the most helpful resources for me. Sharing our thoughts and giving, um, giving and getting back feedback has been a very interesting and important step in my project as the collaboration between the students and the advisors helped generate new ideas. This is from uh, Will, Entrepreneurship and E-Commerce. Having people present new ideas and question different aspects of our own projects has proven to be effective, as personally it has allowed me to think from different perspectives. I often get asked questions that I might not know the answer to yet, which helps to further my thought into my project. Stephen added, the SDL program is possibly the best part of my senior year. I'm given time and support to use my passion to do something that I love. In addition to giving me a period to work on my own personal projects, it has challenged me to think differently about the production process of a film and to identify <laughs> skills that I need. And Cole's interest was in playwriting, and he said, the most impactful learning experiences I've had have been the ones in which I discovered something on my own. A lot of my learning comes from trial and error, discovering what works for me and what does not. When finding a method of organization for my script, I came across and tried several different ways of doing it, often learning more about what doesn't work than what does, which I think is incredibly important to an SDL project. And then Mo's interest was in documentary filmmaking, and she said, one of the biggest values of the class is it forces you to be successful independently. Whether you're working in a group or alone, you are still on an island trying to reach a goal. Yes, there can be help along the way, but truthfully, if you want anything to get accomplished, you have to do it. Thank you. So uh, student responses really refer to learning that is rooted in independence and self-motivation, self-governance and time management, community and collaboration, creative and divergent thinking, accumulation of skills and knowledge, to passion and also to problem solving. And along the problem solving, Students were also asked in this reflective writing, what challenges have you faced and how did you meet them? And their challenges and solutions include uh, simply establishing a clear path for a project. There are various ways to make that happen. Um, jumping in to start working and amending as they go. Consulting with peers and advisors. Um, planning can be a challenge and so we're teaching and hopefully guiding students to work in the short term while thinking about the long term. Uh, managing expectations. Uh, we've had guest speakers come in to talk about programs and project design and we've been helping students to narrow the scope of their project based on the time they have and their resources. Uh, working collaboratively can sometimes be a challenge and so relationships have to be built. Um, a lack of equipment for some of our filmmakers has been a challenge and I'm happy to say that uh, Gabby and Mo recently uh, applied to the High School Parents Association for a, a grant for an equipment purchase that was funded. So we have a microphone on the way to the Student Parents Association. Lack of capital. Will Gibson, who's doing e-commerce and, um, and uh, entrepreneurship, has been raising money and testing the market for his business on eBay and, and providing himself funding and, and product design. You'll hear more from, from Dylan when he talks about figuring out how to design his, uh, parts of his helicopter and you have to look at lots of options. Um, and now this is really the best part. That was, that was the... Uh, kind of laying the platform. And so now I'd like to introduce Stephen Bennett, who is here. Uh, he's been working on a filmmaking project. And Dylan Krobo, who is here. He's been working on helicopter design and engineering. And I'll let you guys come up. Maybe you can take a few minutes to explain. Dylan, you can come up at the same time. You can take a few minutes to explain exactly what you're doing. And then I think we'll open it to any questions that you have, uh, particularly for these two. But Ben, and I think also any questions if you have. But you have these guys now, so they're going to spend I uh, wish John chose a uh, different picture to represent our project. That was just our uh, audition flyer. A little picture of uh, Nicolas Cage superimposed as uh, Matilda. Anyways, uh, as John's mentioned, my name is Stephen Bennett. Uh, I originally got into the SDL project because, I, as, I, as was mentioned earlier also, I have a strong passion in filmmaking. When I was younger, with my friends, I used to make short films about us playing in cardboard boxes or whatever came to mind. And when I, came, when I came to high school, it started to feel like my passion for filmmaking, I never really had time to work on that. So I was really glad that there was this opportunity as a senior to have a period in the day to work on this. So when I applied for it, I figured, okay, I want to work with someone else. So 
along with Wyatt Newhall, who was unable to make it tonight, we decided to partner up because I knew he knew a lot about cameras and he also had a passion about filmmaking. Now, for originally, we went into it thinking, okay, we're going to like make three different films over the course of a semester, maybe a short film here, a documentary here, and whatnot. And we came up with so many different ideas that we just we realized we only have a semester to do that. We, we only have a semester so far. We need to just narrow in and choose one thing. So after a bunch of different scripts, we ended up going with one script that we started that we uh, had an idea for. So we spent about a month writing the script. In the past, I've tried writing my own full-blown scripts on my own, and I always get writer's block or whatnot. Sometimes it's hard when you don't have someone else pushing you. So that definitely helped having two people working together. It also proved to be a challenge where even though Wyatt and I are good friends, or I say we're good friends, um, sometimes it's always hard to work with someone else, especially if you guys, if you might have a, ch different, uh, a difference in t style of humor or just stylistic differences. But overall, after a month, we were able to complete the, uh, the script. Uh, right now, we are in the proce uh, process of auditioning people throughout the school who are, who are interested in filmmaking. This includes students even beyond the uh, improv and uh, theater groups. So it's been really, we, are, we had our first day of auditions today. We had about four people come in, and we have about, I'd say, uh, another ten. So I'm really excited to see all of this come together as we're trying to find our time to do filming. And I'd really like to say about, a lot of people always say, oh, like, that's cool, like, how's your independent how's your independent study going? I said, oh, you mean my student-driven learning program? And he's like, they're like, oh, that's, that's the same thing. But really, the difference between an independent study and student-driven learning, I think, is that, sure, with student-driven learning, you're kind of, you're independent, you're working, by your, or you're working on a project that you're helming, but you really are reaching out to the community and others try, to try to create something that everyone can be proud of. I'm Dylan Provo. I'm designing a, uh, a full scale, so that's something you drive, um, quadcopter in the um, SDL program. And I'm, I chose that because I've been design, well, playing with and later designing RC things for my whole life. And about freshman or sophomore year, I built a quadcopter and flew it around. And I was like, well, what's the next step? So I kind of started. I had it in the back of my mind that this would be something I really wanted to do, and, but I kind of dismissed it as I don't have the time or resources, and I still don't. But now I have the time. <laughs> I mean, to actually build it, it would be so much money. It's, I, I can't even estimate right now, but my current project is just to design a, basically build the whole thing on a computer. So I have every part, everything, so it would actually work in simulations. Um, and the way I'm doing that is, over the course of last year, through PADS, I was able to take a college-level course in um, SOLIDWORKS, which is the m most popular um, CAD design program. And that's actually what's up on the screen there, is a render of a uh, part I designed in SOLIDWORKS. Which, that's a good example, actually, because it, um, it brings to the table, or brings up one of the most important aspects of it, which is organizing, which previously I had not. But right when I did that render, I was, I was beginning to organize everything. And I can tell that is a first draft of a part because it has a blue background. Um, second drafts, I don't have any right now, although I've started to redesign that one because I'm going with a multi-blade or a multi -blade design. Will be green and final drafts will have a white background. That way I can <coughs> look at what is um, a first, second, and third draft for a final presentation. Um, Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much else there is to say about it. Thank you. Anything about the questions? Absolutely. Have you reached out and found community mentors to bounce ideas off of or to get some expertise from in either of your projects? Yeah, sure. um, so right now the only support that I'd say is within the school is with uh, both uh, Mr. Holbridge and uh, Mr. Raymond and also we have Ms. Nielsen who is, does a lot of the technology stuff within the school. She's lending us a uh, microphone to use and uh, some camera equipment. But other than that we haven't reached out to anyone else yet. Can I, Stephen, I would just add, um, this summer 
there was a film commissioned for Cape History with the Campbell Brothers. Yeah. And they're both still local, and I'm sure would love to consult if that would be helpful to you. They're very busy with their filmmaking still. Just a thought. Yeah, I actually met uh, one of them this summer. I did. Uh, I started this crew for what's called the 48-hour film festival, mm -hmm. where you have to create a film within 48 hours over the course of a weekend. It was really fun. We were able to get 15 kids for our crew. We didn't win any awards, but I, we did get to meet you them. Did it. That's yeah, awesome. it was a lot of a lot of fun. A good learning experience for sure. I, I'm just wondering for both of you. I think you're both seniors, right? Yes. If um, having participated in this, if you feel like it's altered your path for the next release few years, it, would you think you'd be doing something differently in the next, you know, your future in the college years, assuming you go to college? Um, if you hadn't done this? Well, um, because I'm basically the project I'm doing is kind of following my passion, it's kind of just fortified what I already thought I was going to do in the future rather than changed anything. Um, over the past couple of years, I've been bouncing around what I wanted to do, whether it be become a filmmaker, be a teacher, be a dentist, be a lawyer, keeps on going around. Um, I feel like this program, my, my real dream is to become like a screenwriter <laughs> to uh, work with film production. And just by working on this film and just having time to work on all the different skills, it's definitely making, um, allowing me to realize that it definitely is a possibility for a career in the future. Dylan, you, you said you've already built and flown a, a quadcopter mm -hmm. before. So obviously, this is a long time passion for you. Yeah. For you. What, what's been different about um, doing this through the student driven learning program as opposed to when you? done this kind of thing on your own? Well, what I did on my own was kind of sort of like when people build their own computers, I bought a frame for the quadcopter, then I bought a flight control board, batteries, speed controllers, and motors, and you kind of just put it all together and program it a little bit, and you have a quadcopter, whereas with the big model, I can't do that that simply, or anywhere near that, because um, a small helicopter has a motor on each rotor, and it changes the speed of the rotors to change the direction it goes. But that's not something feasible with giant engines. You can't put one on the end of each arm. You actually put one in the center, and then that means you have to vary the pitch, like an actual helicopter does, varying the pitch of the blades to increase thrust per blade. So and it, other than the shape, it shares very little in common with the small multi-rotors. So it's a more complex project. Mm -hmm. So. Um, how, how have, um, have teachers been able to guide you? This isn't rotor design. It's probably not something that's a specialty of any particular mm -hmm. teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School. How have, how have teachers participated in guiding you in this, Even to in this process? You didn't answer if there was anybody in the community that was able oh. to help you. Oh, well, uh, Tom actually put me in, um, in contact with a guy who volunteers at Cape called Tom Wacker, who I believe he's yeah, he's an engineer. I think lubrication engineer was his main thing. Um, I've met with him once and we kind of just talked about, because um, I will need his help for uh, lubrication for a lot of aspects of it, but we also talked about it's just good to have another engineer to bounce ideas off of. And as well as my um, uncle works in Boston down at a company called Draper. And with, although they're um, not quite in the market of full-scale helicopters, they've moved heavily into the drone field, so they have picked up a bunch of aeronautical engineers I'm going to attempt to make contact with in the near future. Thank you. So you guys are seniors. Um, when do you think we should start this? You know, the process, you're, you're, half, you're halfway through the process. Um, what would you suggest for your younger sister, your uh, kids in the neighborhood, what age is a good age that we should be advocating or doing this in the district? Um, to an extent, I think we should try to uh, at least somewhat mimic what Baxter is doing with their Flex Friday plan. Maybe there's not enough room in the schedule right now for high schoolers or middle schoolers for that matter to, have, to be able to devote one day out of a whole week to uh, work on a certain project. But it's definitely something that, like, I wish when I came in my freshman year, this was an opportunity that I had. So I definitely all eight, or younger ages would definitely or it would be appealing to them. I definitely would have liked more than one year, especially with a complex project. 
And then how much time, you know, so you have a history class, how much time do you think about history versus how much time are you thinking about this um, experience? <laughs> Sorry, Ms. <Mr>. Teachers. <laughs> no, that's okay. I said math teachers. Or, you know. I'm going to override that question. <laughs> um, you're off the hook. I do have just maybe one last question for you. Do you have any advice for other students who are considering this type of a project or program? Uh, I'd say they should absolutely join the program. They have, get uh, two great mentors automatically when they sign up. And uh, yeah, it's a great, great use of time. It's better than having a study hall, I'd say. Or, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty much just what he said. Did I? Yeah. Cool. I'll just ask for the record, your name? Thank you. And I'm not sure that that was picked up at home, but essentially her, her point was that you know, time and space are what are part of what's making the difference for you, being able to fit this into your school day as a part of the work. And um, Kathy was just raising the point that making that time and space, there's no reason that couldn't happen at the middle school level as yes. well. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much. This has been really exciting. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work on that, John. Yeah, thanks. Be happy to talk anytime. Um, on to our next item on the agenda. Thank you so much, by the way, for coming in this evening. I know that you probably have some helicopters to and some movies. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, on to item 5E, e, Administrator's Strategic Plan Updates. Things are happening. Um, with all sorts of things happening in district where we're getting report outs on wonderful projects like the student-driven learning, um, we had our screening in the last week of the movie Beyond Measure for the community. And it's been a really good tie-in to our next round of PD that's happening this week with Dr. Michael Shackelford. We have teachers who were working with him in district today and another group will be working with him tomorrow on project-based and problem-based learning. And so it really dovetails with a lot of what we've been looking at. How do we get students engaged? How do we get them really passionately involved in their own learning and taking ownership of that? It's one thing to just say, here's a list of facts about the Civil War, and another to say, here's a scenario. What do you do? What do you need to know in order to make a decision here? What is your role? And it's another entry point that's much more engaging. It gives the students an opportunity to own their learning and to go deeper rather than just memorizing facts. And so we're really looking at those opportunities across district. We did walkthroughs with him yesterday looking at some of the instructional practices that help to really foster that in the classroom. And um, <coughs> we have our GT teacher who's been working with teachers to bring some of those practices to the fore as well, and we'll let Kelly talk more about that. Um, but really, <clears throat> teachers are starting to get excited about the other opportunities. They're starting to ask for more. How else can we do this? I have a couple of book studies that are starting to get rolling about how, what else can we learn? Can we get together? Can we discuss these ideas? Can we, how do we pick it apart and push each other a little bit to do more? And so. That's an exciting place to be. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting. Hello. 
So looking at the district mission, vision, and values of the CAPE, obviously we're keying in on the, the P for passion, um, and that statement uh, that we value personal investment in learning in an environment that, an environment, excuse me, that nourishes joy and cre creativity, protects risk-taking, and cultivates individual expression. Um, certainly you're already hearing a lot around um, that piece of the district mission, vision, and, and values. And so that statement got me thinking of what are some examples of efforts and initiatives to promote that passion um, at the middle school. And one example that, that comes to mind is our emerging makerspace concept at the middle school um, as an innovation space that really promotes the four C's of 21st century learning, the communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and creativity. Um, I've been working closely with Jonathan Warner and Amanda Kozaka and, and many students um, in looking at what is the, the idea around uh, the maker space. And uh, I had a couple of quotes that really spoke to me around this. One is from Laura Fleming, who's the author of Worlds of Making, among many other publications. And um, she says, a maker space is a metaphor for a unique learning environment that encourages tinkering, play, and open-ended exploration for all. And the second is from Chrissy Venisdale. Um, she writes a Make Place blog called um, Ben Spired, and she's an innovation coordinator at a school in Houston, Texas. And she said, maybe the idea isn't to put a maker space in a school. Maybe it's to put kids in the kind of environments that bring out the maker space in them. And that really, uh, you know, certainly speaks to and gets us thinking about how is it that we're structuring our environment to fit what students are passionate about. Um, one example, I'm not sure why that's happening. <laughs> Should I stand back? I think you're okay. Am I just electric tonight? <laughs> um, one example uh, is just that um, we, we had a student who's very interested in uh, construction and building materials and we, we identify the student who because of that strong interest and aptitude um, has wanted to get very involved in the design, inventory and setup of our, our maker space. As an offshoot of the maker space concept, um, it came in the form of, of wanting to do a publishing house. Um, so right now we have a group of students who are very interested and have come together. It is an after school group um, with a mindfulness to talk about how we can push many, as many opportunities as we can into the school day. Um, but um, John Holdridge and Elizabeth Johnston conceived of an idea and advertised a publishing house to generate student interest. And we had a multi-age group of students that have come together. They generated ideas for what they could do, what they wanted to accomplish. We have visiting artists who are coming to visit um, classrooms for, that the students are in, in the after school group, and they're gonna be co-teaching classes with those artists that are coming in to work with them. The projects are completely drawn from their interests. They're interested in the idea they've come up with is to have a launch party in about six weeks, and they wanna have their published pieces ready for exhibit, including um, zines, books, and other pop-up books that they wanted to create. While that was happening, a second group came forward to Elizabeth, um, students who just love writing, and they said, we'd love to have a writer's group um, somehow. How could we establish that? And so we've managed with John, with Elizabeth, to find outside mentors who could work with them from Unwritten Roads, which is a creative writing approach that's been compared to um, a, a telling room that travels in concept, and they're moving around to different places to work with students rather than being based in in one place um, with an interest in publishing a collection of stories um, with we have possible help from a parent author and publisher who's come forward as well. Um, also in the topic of writing we have a National Honor Society high school students who are currently working with our fifth graders on their writing. They come a few times a week depending on the schedule rotation and they're working on a letters about literature competition which is a national reading and writing contest for students grades 4 through 12. Um, we've had many requests and we're recognizing increasing needs for customized learning experiences. Um, we have students who are taking online courses during the summer and during the school year. Um, we've had opportunities for students to go to the high school to attend classes and to individualize programming. And thank you to Mr. Shedd for working with us and helping make those things happen. 
Um, we've established a middle school E team um, with Mr. Duffy, <coughs> Jack Duffy, Jonathan Warner, Amanda Kuzaka, and where um, students are being trained to provide in-class tech support for um, not only students, but a lot of us <laughs> teachers, administrators alike. Um, we had a, we're having a big hour of code celebration this week as part of Computer Science Education Week. Um, you know, again, we're ready to teach those 21st century skills and students in many ways are participating in coding opportunities through science, through Spanish, through their computer science class and through something called our Idea Lab classes. And our Idea Lab, all fifth and sixth grade students um, opposite their world language classes are participating in exploring topics around technology, dig digital citizenship, um, they're brainstorming and any innovative ideas about their own learning. And uh, Jonathan and Amanda have brought the fifth and sixth grade Idea Lab students into the design of the and engineering of the maker space. Um, and as Ruth Ellen mentioned, we. Um, continue working with Molly <coughs> Kellogg uh, to just identify additional challenges and extension work that we can for students. And we're really just trying to maintain a focus on creating space for any student-led initiatives. When students bring ideas forward, could we do this? We're much more about saying why not and how can we get obstacles out of your way. Things like our civil rights team being formed, student-led, our peer helpers program, uh, we have a dream factory group and I could go on and give several examples of ideas that students have generated, they're interested and passionate about and we have um, people in the community who are eager and very willing to support those initiatives. Any questions? Thank you. Wait a minute. Oh, I, oh. I have a question. Have a question. Okay. Um, how are you finding the kids, and really, how are you not? How are you? Is it twenty percent of the students who are being identified or um, having a voice that's able to stand up? What about you know? I you, you might. You, I think there are ideas that are just emerging in conversations and as an example, the, the, the screening of the film as a, in impetus and it promotes conversations and it gets people thinking a little differently and outside the box and asking, well, what if, or I wonder if we could, and it just seems to travel that way. So it's just a very emergent series of conversations. Was the movie shown to all of middle school? The, the Beyond Measure? Yes. Uh, no, just the screening that, yeah. that we've had, so yeah. Just wondering, um, I think it, this is, I think it's great, it's trickling. Um, I think the more we do it, it's fabulous. Um, and I guess I just, <coughs> you know, there's those Shire kids who aren't, so our teachers and your student teams and your um, STPs, is, it, is that the term? STPs? That's a high school. That's a high school. So, oh, no, no, so when. Advise, yeah, so as a, in, in advisors are keying into do the teachers interests? know to, you know, okay, look for a kid in every advisory, bring up a... It, it's a big know, part about knowing what's out there, knowing your students, hearing what right. they're interested in, taking those opportunities to have the deeper conversations with students. What are you really interested in? What, what drives you? What gives you that fire in your, in your belly and being aware of all the opportunities that are out there? Um, and creating opportunities and pulling in people like John Holdridge and brainstorming, that's a wild ride. Yeah. Um, and you know, people just getting the creative juices flowing and yeah. you know, talking with people and um, just give, giving yourselves permission to be innovative and ask why not instead of why, so. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you getting rid of that? <laughs> it was Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, how did you I know CPR. We're just going to discharge. Good evening. So sorry. No, that's okay. Um, good evening. So I'm going to really just focus on one grade level tonight, um, talking about um, passion and um, inter interdisciplinary collaboration um, in studies. 
Um, our third grade is currently um, studying um, Egypt, and some of you have had, have had children go through, and it's a very motivating unit. Um, this year, though, um, the teachers are raising it to a, a, a higher level of learning. Um, they're working closely with um, gifted and talented consultant Molly Kellogg, who we have every Thursday across the district, and so our third grade teachers have really um, been working very closely with her on having her help them develop essential questions for what they want students to understand, know, um, and be able to really show their learning. And the concept of um, any kind of ancient civilization can be rather abstract. And so um, to go along with that, um, the teachers are also um, having artists in residence Gretchen Berg come, and they're going to be doing a physical theater performance on December 21st, 145, cafetorium. You're all invited. Good invitations. Um, and, um, but just to give you an idea about what these essential questions are and what the themes are, we currently have five third grades. And uh, so Fran Vita Taylor's class is going to focus on the daily life of typical Egyptian citizen um, during ancient times and also comparing and contrasting what typical life for uh, Egyptian children versus uh, Egyptian adults would be. Um, how was daily life different for peasants, craftsmen, servants, noblemen? So thinking about the class system at that time. Um, Sarah Adams, um, third grade class, is going to um, focus on the role of what did Egyptian gods and goddesses play? What role did they play in Egyptian life? Um, so really getting into the myths and beliefs back in that ancient civilization? And how did the stories of Egyptian gods and goddesses help explain daily events? Um, and Valente's um, third grade class is going to um, focus on the geography of Egypt and how that affected the people and the culture of ancient Egypt. Holly Forsyth's class is going to focus on pyramids and mummies, popular one. Um, and so what the essential question really um, is, what do pyramids and mummies teach us about ancient Egyptian culture? And so really leveraging what those ancient artifacts that we currently still have access to, um, what, are, what can children learn from that? And why did ancient Egyptians mummify those who passed away? So really getting into rituals, ancient rituals and culture, how that um, plays into um, their learning. And then lastly, Talia Edlin's class is um, going to be focusing on ancient Egyptian pharaohs. How did they run their country? And I think in a time of um, an election year coming up, um, it can be pretty fascinating. How did ancient Egyptian citizens view their pharaoh? And why do you think that some ancient Egyptian pharaohs are still known and studied today? So what made some more prominent than others? And so they're, the students um, are doing research on these focus areas, and then they're working with Gretchen to um, create and develop their own um, physical theater performances, their own individual performances. That is really powerful, because that is, when I think of, you know, in, in many ways, it really is student-driven learning right there, because they're the ones planning. Gretchen's not saying, here's the script, and this is what you're going to do. Stand there, you do this. And it, as, if you're familiar with Gretchen's work, it's physical theater, no props. Um, the students are the props, there's no scenery, there's no costumes, so they really have to make that learning. They really have to make it visual um, in, a, in a very different way. So that's um, one report. Any questions? I have a question. Of course. I'm not, I think it's just, I may have misheard or I didn't quite understand. So Mary, Molly Kellogg. Molly Kellogg. Is she working with all the teachers and all the students? Yes, and it's a really good question because um, that I think it I think it speaks to the fact that she's not just limited to students who are identified as gifted and talented, you know, which which starts in third grade and goes to twelfth. But it, she's working with <coughs> all the teachers. So her work on how we raise the um, level of learning for all students, how we lift that for all students, it doesn't matter about whether or not we're looking at her, her work influencing just students who are identified as gifted and talented. It's really forever. And it, and it really speaks to how she's working closely with um, helping the teachers. So she's doing a lot of professional development with the teachers on this. So when I mentioned, I just wanted to give the, an example of some of that work, which is right now the essential question. So really having the end in mind, what is it we want students to know? And it's not just a fun, yeah, it's really fun to dress up in 
learn about Egypt and have play market time or something like that. It's far more involved in that. It's really helping them <coughs> deeply. And really think about the impact of today. Like what, does, what do ancient civilizations, what kind of impact does that have on today's life and comparing it to those kinds of things. I just want to make a comment because it's, I dropped off my daughter today before I realized this was coming on, um, on the agenda for them, and she took five minutes at, when I dropped her off, just ex spontaneously telling me about how they're, they're studying Egypt and about whether or not there were female pharaohs, and, and I don't know, but that's what she was wondering about, and then how like supposedly there's a queen that they might be buried behind one of the king's tombs, and. Um, it's the first time, really, that she, first, especially when I'm dropping off at school, has taken time. She hates being late, and I'm sorry, I'm always making her late, but she, like, uh, was saying, you know, going into detail about something she's about to do in school, and it was a remarkable and notable difference for me to see her engaged in that. And then um, along those lines, later today after school, she, one of her brother's history books were out on the table, and she started perusing the history book. Okay, she's tapping, tapping into something here that is of her interest, so. Wonderful. You set an alarm to help you get her to school on time. Almost to wake me up. That's a pharaoh calling right now, yes. yes. Um, no, that's wonderful to hear, because we're seeing that same excitement in, in the fact that she's, she's telling you about that. She's beginning, you know, she, her school day. It's yeah. fantastic to hear, so Great. pass that along to her teacher if, if the teacher's not watching. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Last but not least. So as with Mike and Kelly, I'm just going to highlight a few things. Um, and the first one is actually I wanted to, to, to mention and highlight the biggest bang for the buck um, that the school board, the community um, gets in terms of student engagement is our co-curricular program an extracurricular program. And I didn't want that to be forgotten, and we haven't talked about that much in the context of sort of how to engage kids' passions. Um, and I wanted to highlight a few, because um, one of the things that we have done over the last couple of years is, as, as Mike was talking about as well at the middle school, being very supportive, as supportive as we can be when students come to us with ideas uh, for new clubs. Um, and the way things work when new clubs get organized, they basically there is not a, st a stipend for it. So there are teachers who are organ who are supporting these clubs essentially because they want to support kids. Um, so I wanted to mention a couple. Well, I wanted to mention the ones I'm aware of. Um, Code HS, you've heard about it a little bit. Um, that's Ginger Raspiller, who's our Achievement Center coordinator, and Carolyn Young, our librarian, who are um, working together to support kids learn the basics of coding. Um, this year we had a 70s <coughs> rock club, a request for a 70s rock club. club. So Dr. Gret, um, Dr. Gret's Wednesday afternoon is listening to... The Electric um, Light Orchestra? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, anybody has, if anybody has records that they would like to share, there is a turntable in Dr. Gret's room, but there are a limited oh. supply of records. Um, if anybody has any reasonably good condition records, we've got Sadly, kids who'd love to listen to 70s rock and roll. So. <laughs> That would be great. Uh, we have a knitting club. Uh, Ms. O'Brien um, spends an afternoon knitting with a group of students. Um, <laughs> this year, uh, we have a, uh, what's being called a cultural communications club, um, which sort of sounds like something out of Soviet Russia, because it doesn't really speak to anything. But what it is, it's a group of kids who go into Portland at the Hall School in Portland every Friday afternoon, and they work with recent immigrants. Um, um, kids who are learning English as a second language. Uh, for the last few years, as you probably know, we have sponsored <coughs> TEDx events at the high school. On the in-between years, there's a TEDx club that Ms. Nielsen is working with to support. Um, um, Stephen Bennett, who was speaking earlier today, last year, his inspiration was to create a club called Peace Jam. Um, and that's become a, a really very thriving club, which has been really exciting to see, and it's been a great leadership experience for Stephen, actually, as well. Um, this year, we have a, uh, another group with a sort of a, a name that doesn't communicate very much, and it's a group of kids who are interested in causes related to feminism. So right now, it's called the Interfem Club. Um, 
and I think there's another word in there somewhere, but they keep changing the name about every time they get together. So I'm actually meeting with them on Thursday, and we're, we're going to work together to um, coordinate an event that we hope to have later in the spring. Um, and I also wanted to mention that t because tomorrow we have the math team going out. We, we are probably the only school in the state of Maine uh, that fills a school bus uh, with our math team members. We don't always win the math team uh, math, math championship, but we fill the buses with kids avid to practice their math skills. Are you going tomorrow, Natalie? Excellent. Um, and then mock trial. Tomorrow we're going into the state championship for the sixth time in a row. Um, I'll wake David Hillman up by, um, by reminding you that he is one of the volunteer coaches. <laughs> he, is, he is tired because he spends hours and hours. He's not really, a, he's not, he's really paying attention, I know. He spends hours and hours and hours as an unpaid volunteer. There is no group who works more intensely uh, than Mock Royale. It's actually quite remarkable the number of hours they get out of students. And then there's other things like, as you know, World Affairs Council speech and debate, not to mention athletics. So I just wanted to mention those clubs and particularly to highlight the ones that are happening out of the goodness of the heart, um, hearts of, of teachers in the school who have um, extended their time. And then I just wanted to mention another one. Earlier this <coughs> year, uh, we have a student um, who recently came from a European country who came a few years ago and has mo recently developed a passion for really digging into learning English. I think there was some cultural denial for about the first year and a half that he was in America and he wasn't going to be going back to his home country. He's a really, really um, wonderful young man. So inspired by him, this year we looked into Ros I buying Rosetta Stone. Um, and at the time, we only had one student to use it. Well, because we've now bought it, we now have three students who are using Rosetta Stone. Uh, <laughs> So there's that student, and there's another student who recently moved into Cape Elizabeth from Japan. Um, so he is using Rosetta Stone to learn English. And then we have a ninth grade young lady who recently um, came to us as a freshman from a school that doesn't offer a foreign language, and she was really avid about taking French. But this year, because of low enrollments, we don't have a French 1 class, so she has jumped into doing, using Rosetta Stone to take French 1 so that next year she can join a regular <coughs> class of students in French 2. Um, so that was very cool. And we have two more places that I've paid for, and I suspect by the end of the year we will, we will have found a way to, to uh, use those places up. And then I just also wanted to mention that we are exploring with SMCC opportunities for dual enrollment, which basically means that that teachers at a high school offer a class which follows a college curriculum. In this case, it would be a SMCC curriculum. Um, last year, we applied to do that um, in one class, and um, the particular teacher who was applying was decided we needed to wait until she got her master's degree, which she is working towards, but she wasn't ready. But for next year, I'm reasonably confident that we are going to have a math class um, that will likely be a senior math offering uh, that will follow in us. It's a, a very exciting course called Math Quantitative Reasoning, I believe, is what it is. Um, and there's real excitement in the math department that in many ways it's probably better than a particular class that a lot of our, our seniors take. And it's probably <coughs> more suited to their needs in terms of preparing them to be successful in college without having to go and um, get remedial courses and that sort of thing. So those are the three areas I wanted to highlight. I am glad to answer any questions that anybody has about any of those areas or anything else. Is there still a barbecue club? Yeah. Oh, there is. Yes. But that, because that isn't new and because we win championships every year, I didn't even think to mention it. <laughs> I just mention another. Um, so, please do, because the danger of listing some things is I always forget others. So. Um, so, I don't know if I'd call this like an extracurricular, but um, we, I think there's a group of like three or four students who started the um, the characters of Cape Elizabeth page this year. Um, so, that is really picking up. They're starting to post it on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I know that I think they they were in a um, a local paper for it, um, and they started. I know they followed like. Falmouth did a Faces of Falmouth High School. Um, so we have the characters of Cape Elizabeth, and that is, it's really getting really popular. Um, so two of my friends are um, behind it, and they are working really, I feel like I, I will come across them all the time, sitting in the AC or sitting at lunch, and they'll have just gone to like get a picture of one of the custodians or something, and they're like feverishly typing up. They, they have these long quotes, um, 
And I think that that was a really good idea um, for them to introduce because it's really helping, you know, get people to, I think, to, to look at, their, at the fellow, their fellow students and faculty a little bit differently. Um, it's definitely helped me, like, you know, just feel a little bit more closely connected to everybody in the school. Um, because I've had some people who are featured on Characters of Cape Elizabeth who are already my really good friends, and then I've had people on there who I've never talked to before. Um, and, you know, there are kids who I'm looking at who I'm like, I have no idea who you are, but, you know, it, they're, they're interesting and they have, they have good things to say, so I think that's definitely a notable um, program that we've started this year. I think that's going to be really successful in the coming years. So, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that, Natalie. Great ad. Thank, Thank you. you. Wait a minute, Jeff. Just a little more eloquently, I want to ask, how do you get, so how, how's the guidance piece going where, um, how are we reaching every, every student? I know we're reaching lots of students. This is what I was trying to get out with you, Mike. You know, how are we missing those shy kids? Or are, are the shy kids the easy kids? How are we missing the, you know, because they're, teachers automatically go to the Shire kids? How are we missing maybe some of the more spunky kids who you can't wait to leave your classroom? Is there a system to this? Um, or are we just allowing kids to be themselves and eventually all kids yep. will get, you know, their, their passions? So, it's, so it's, I would say it's, it's really, um I mean, to the extent there is a system, particularly for things like Rosetta Stone or right. the program that John is spearheading, um, or the whole idea of being able to take college courses online or things like that, I mean, those are represented in the program of studies and, and counselors will talk to kids. Um, um, in terms of the SDL program in particular, we will be sending out notices to every single student um, um, much earlier than we did last year, just because the program is in existence now. Um, so everybody will get, get that opportunity. In terms of spreading the word about things like co-curricular activities and that sort of thing, um, we really make a huge push for that um, with freshmen. Um, so every year in the first few weeks of school, uh, we have a big um, extracurricular fair, and all of the clubs come, and the particularly the ninth graders, and then we also have a, a time for the tenth graders as well. They are invited to come down, um, sign up, express some interest in clubs, get their name on an email list. Um, usually there's candy to attract them to tables um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then I would say, you know, for students who are shy or students who are, um, who are struggling in school for about anything, one of the first questions um, that all the counselors, all of the administrators and teachers ask about a student like that is, what do they enjoy doing? Okay. That's our first conversation with the family, it's our first conversation with them, it's the first conversation with their teachers. What seems to get them excited? Um, because if we can find something that gets them excited, whether it's an academic subject or it's an extracurricular, that can act as a critical hook. Um, today, for example, Nate Carpenter and I were meeting with a student who was um, beginning to show some significant signs of struggling. Um, and one of the things that has happened for him is he has lost uh, a connection to a team that he used to be a part of. Um, so Nate and I said, how would you be interested in doing this other team that we know that he, he would be excited about? Great. Um, and so he is going to be joining <coughs> tomorrow with, not because he's being pushed, he was actually very excited about it. As he said, well, the season has already started. How can I possibly do that? And we said, it doesn't matter. A coach is going to be willing right. to take you. So, so that's really what it's about. I mean, that is the first and most important question we have with a kid who is showing signs of disengagement from school. Is what what excites you? What would you like to be involved in? Thank you. Is that that's perfect? Question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. We appreciate hearing how the strategic plan is playing out in our buildings. Um, item 5C, school board goals review. Uh, I think this is 
us. Um, you have in your packets the 2015 Cape Elizabeth School Board goals that we adopted last March. Um, gosh, that seems like yesterday. Um, of all of the goals, the, our strategic planning goals, um, we've reviewed our professional development goals and cost and confirmed the balance between the cost and the district goals and staff directed self-improvement opportunities and workload that's part of really a big heavy lift is part of the budgeting process that we evaluate that as we go along. Um, under policy, um, we were continuing to audit the Cape Elizabeth School Board Policy Manual to align our district goals with our student needs and that work is continuing ongoing. Um, I'm not quite sure that will ever actually be done, but we do need to have those as a goal as a focus. Um, under resources, um, item four, we were we did complete our contract negotiations with the administrative um, support personnel, EdTech 1, EdTech 2s, and EdTech 3s, as well as our bus drivers, custodians, food service, and maintenance and mechanic. It was a heavy lift for the year for everyone for negotiations. Um, item five, uh, we do support, sponsor a school budget that explicitly aligns with the strategic plan and maintains vital programs and services. Again, that's really part of the heavy lift of during our budgeting process. Um, item six, support funding requirements for the 10-year capital improvement plan. Thank you to our Ace Ventura <laughs> finance chair, um, and as well as the heavy lifting with our superintendent, our new business administrator, and the district leadership team to ensure that those goals are met. Accountability, ability, and communication, easy for me to say. Um, we have actually created a district-wide teacher evaluation standard that's also been some heavy lifting this past year, and as I Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're ready to pilot the teacher evaluation. Piloting yes. teacher and administrator. So um, kudos for that work. So the committee, thank you very much mm -hmm. for that. Um, item eight, sadly, we have not met the goal of to creating a website that serves multiple stakeholders, students, teachers, parents, and community members, um, maybe next year. Yeah, I would just add that's an area where we withdrew funding um, as part of the budget process late in, in the workload. Um, we are, we've are we been continuing to do work in that area. We do hope that we will be able to launch an updated website in, the new, in 2016. Um, but, but that timetable has lagged because we haven't had resources to put behind it. Um, gone but not forgotten. Well, we didn't actually withdraw it. We were well, to make a cut yes and therefore we lost money it was the area where we chose to reduce the allocation <laughs> so moving on item nine <laughs> did, you, did you have a comment on item eight well you know i have to uh, appreciate that this was the one that you could say is um the least directed to students and so out of everything this was the one area. It does um, impact students greatly. Could a lot of our time and energy for teachers, administrators be, um, could we be avoiding a lot of, you know, a confusion and um, disruption <coughs> because we don't have a good communication system? Yes, you know, so we're, we're doing manual stuff where it could be automated but it doesn't affect student direct learning, so it had to be cut. So thank you for putting it out there. It was my version. Vit, vit, you know, is how I how we saw it happening. Um, item nine, promote two-way communication and foster positive school climate. We do continue to work towards that goal feverishly, um, thanks to our leadership of the superintendent and working with an organizational developer and a, surfacing and addressing any of the issues that have come up within our district and we can't change them until we identify them and we can't um, identify them without that heavy lifting so thank you for your leadership on that um, item 10 create an online district report card to measure progress against the strategic plan based on the indicators of success I'm not quite sure if the report card we envisioned has quite made it but we have come up with a very comprehensive um, indicators of success 
document that is housed on the school board link on the website that we actually just reviewed last month in a workshop. Um, item 11, ensure our curriculum and instructional practices assist our students in achieving 21st century student outcomes as well as the main learning results. Um, I believe that everything we have heard to date from our, our um, ELO and our district leadership team has showed the support behind that in our district. And again, I thank you all for helping get our um, engines going in that regard. And then item 12, um, under our school board goals, our final goal was to monitor the work towards <coughs> adopting proficiency-based diplomas, electronic student portfolios, and implementation of differential instruction. And that work is ongoing. Any comments, questions? Yes, Barbara. Um, I wanted, unless I had a brief blip, I think you didn't read one vision, because I wanted to a compliment uh, this new routine we have of having Ruth Allen and our principal stand up and give. It reads, monitor strategic plan implementation and partner with stakeholders <coughs> status. I really enjoy these reports that we hear now. I think it helps the community better key into the strategic plan, keep it as a live document. So I'm really appreciating all of you coming in and filling us in on those. And the only other thing I would comment on the accountability communication somehow if there's a way I'm sure it has to be a capacity issue but I'm feeling badly that we aren't taping our off-site meetings the regular meeting in November and workshops and all there used to be someone that came and taped for us and just so people have a chance if they can't come you know to see a board meeting and hear discussion I don't know if that's a budget Press for us. We have done that only in budget, at least in the time that I've been here. The workshop meetings have not been taped historically. Only the budget workshops have been taped, but certainly if that's something the board wants to visit as we move into the budget cycle, we can certainly allocate. Um, well, the, especially the November regular meeting that we held off-site, I think would have been helpful to be taped. So as long as we just kind of keep that in mind. If, if the practice has been budget workshops only, I, I get that. But when we're off-site for a regular, I think it'd be great if we made sure those get taped. Yeah. We, we try to get the space whenever possible, and right. as you can right. imagine, it's November juggled with other work. town. Yeah, Could November be. didn't work. Thank you. Um, I would say that in my course of being on the board for four years, having a regular workshop, having a regular school board business meeting not taped, I believe that was the only time that I can recall. So it was an anomaly, and right. certainly something we do our best to strive for. Any other comments or questions or feedback so far on our 2015 goals? When we um, have our new board members seated, we will um, reconvene and um, look at these goals, assess our progress, and come up with new ones <coughs> in the new year. Thank you. Um, item five, recognition of departing board members. So um, the years and years and hours and hours and days and days of service, <coughs> um, it is with bittersweet um, emotions, oh, don't make me, don't look, I'm going to get off the TV, <laughs> that I would just look at David. Okay, that'll do it. So. <laughs> well, I have to look back? <laughs> no, you don't. Um, I, I would just really like to um, say, for each and every one of our departing colleagues that <coughs> it is because of you that we have accomplished things like our 2015 goals, our 2014 goals, all of the other heavy lifting that we've done with the negotiations processes, with you know, heavy lifting with the strategic plan. I believe the strategic plan started in your, in your tenure, um, bringing on with the superintendent and setting our district in a completely different direction than when it was when you started. And so if the measure of success is how things look now compared to how you started, um, I would say that the measure of success is immeasurable. You have all contributed an enormous amount to our district. And I'm fairly certain that there are other board members who would like to share similar sentiments. 
Yeah, I would. And uh, a pardon how, how long this is, but I think uh, it's justified, and I'll, I'll read it. Uh, I would like to thank Kate, David, and John for their service to the community over the past six years. As a group, they held every leadership position on the school board, including chair, vice chair, finance chair, policy chair, and participated in countless committees, from interview committees to negotiations committees to teacher evaluation committees. Since they joined the board, the district has developed a new mission and vision statement, a new strategic plan, and a new capital stewardship plan. They were instrumental in developing these plans and fostering a willingness to identify what the district did well and what the district needs to do better. Our schools are stronger because of their dedication and service. And uh, Kate, I would like to thank you personally for your commitment to ensuring every child in our schools has an opportunity uh, to thrive and no child goes overlooked. Your passion for education and children will be sorely missed. I want you to know that I always knew exactly what you were trying to say. <laughs> uh, th thank you for your service. Uh, John, I would like to thank you for your leadership and commitment to ensuring every child has an opportunity to find their own path to success. Your constant focus on the goal of creating multiple pathways for students to succeed has been critical in moving the district forward. Without your leadership, calm demeanor and perseverance, we might have lost sight of where we need to go. I greatly value your character and friendship. Thank you for your service. And David, if he's awake, um, I would like to thank you for your unflinching commitment to safeguarding student rights and protecting their opportunity to bo both succeed and fail. You were instrumental in shaping and changing many policies that will result in many students getting the second chance they deserve. I also want to thank you for walking the walk and sticking to your views on many challenging decisions. I greatly respect your integrity, honesty, and intelligence. Uh, I do have one bone to pick with you, David. Uh, Only one? For far too long, you made slanderous statements about potted plants, <laughs> challenging their character and tension. You purposely targeted a group which is unable to speak for themselves. Uh, David, you certainly are no potted plant. As a reminder of your school board experience, <laughs> and your impact. <laughs> and your impact on making our school stronger. I would like to give you this potted plan, and if you would please read the card on the plan. It says, "Oh, I like this. I am not David Hillman." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Kate, John, and David, uh, thank you for your service, and I will meet uh, miss each of you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I, I uh, focused specifically on one person because I, I thought that was my memo. <laughs> but um, anyway, I want I want to thank all three of you. Um, and so I'm I'm toasting or roasting John. And um, when I was starting to write this, I I had trouble like, okay, am I talking to the audience or am I talking to John? And in the end, I ended up writing a dear John letter. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> First, I first time I heard your name, John Christie, was during the 2009 election season when you first campaigned to join the school board. I didn't recognize your name at the time and so asked a few people who I imagined might know of you. From the first to the last, every person I talked to spoke of you, John, as a really good guy and one of the good guys. The fact that your family and you had recently moved to Maine from New York seemed to be an end note and somewhat inconsequential. To me, however, this fact seemed to provide the most significant clue into your character. What sort of person, I wondered, would dare to enter the choppy waters of local politics fresh off the boat? I marveled at the courage this sort of decision required and determined that you must be one of two types. One, either a flashy sort who followed the spotlight and loved to hear himself talk, or two, a seriously brave dad committed to contributing to the well-being and education of all our children. Nearly a year later, when I finally met you and your family at a party, I knew instantly that you were not, most definitely, the limelight, loving, flashy type. Not because you stood quietly with a scruffy beard flipping burgers and drinking a beer, which I'm pretty sure was from a can, but because, as we spoke, I felt that you were fully present and sincere in everything we talked about. There was no pretense, only authenticity, which is my definition of a really good guy. Over the years that have followed that evening, I have been so for fortunate to share many more moments with you, first as a friend and eventually also as a fellow school board member. 
As a friend, your kindness, humor, intelligence, and sense of adventure have made it easy for me to take for granted the endless hours of good work and goodwill you have dedicated to our community and our children over your school board tenure. As a fellow board member, however, it is impossible to appreciate one without fully appreciating the other. In the six years you have served on the board, you, along with David and Kate, have been directly involved in the creation and implementation of so many critical decisions and progressive programs for our district. To name just a few, defining our district's mission and vision, implementing a powerful and holistic strategic plan that will help prepare students to succeed in the future, recognizing and hiring a visionary superintendent such as we have in Meredith, securing a healthy economics um, CIP, bringing full day kindergarten to our young, striving to support and improve the opportunities for our most vulnerable students, ensuring that all school policies prioritize students' best interest, respectfully and wisely leading fellow board members as chairman, responding to all emails and questions from the public with grace and sensitivity, and above all, firmly believing that all students can and will thrive in an environment that truly values, supports, and promotes each person's unique skills and passions. You have accomplished so much and laid the groundwork for even more. You have greatly succeeding, succeeded doing all of this while simultaneously leading your own IT company and raising two incredible children with your wife, Megan. Your ability to do this and still find time to pursue your other passions is inspiring. As a fellow board member, I'm extremely grateful for all that you are, all that, that you have done, and all that you are passing on to us fellow members. I know that the fruits of your labor and commitment will continue to be sown in the years ahead. As a friend, I am most grateful to have had the opportunity to work, learn, and explore alongside you both on water and on land. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to all three of you. Thank you, Thank you Susanna. Um, I just also wanted to say um, a few words about um, Kate in particular. Um, ironically enough, Kate and I ended up growing up as childhood friends miles from one another, um, and we have found ourselves growing closer here in Cape Elizabeth than we did in our hometown where we grew up. Um, ironically enough, I graduated from high school with Kate's little sister. Kristen, who was always, just like Kate, um, an incredible visionary um, person who includes everyone who's at the table equally and honestly and deeply and cares so much about her fellow man. I'm very happy and very proud to have gotten to know another Williams. Thank you. So with this, we have um, just tokens of appreciation from our fellow board members. Um, they are the John Revere Silver Bowls. And I know that there was a memo that went out at the 11th hour that um, Kate and John had talked and said they didn't want gifts, David. Thank you very much. I didn't say that, you know. <laughs> no, no. Um, and that you would have preferred that there be funding instead that went to the innovation team. And I pledge that instead of a personal gift for you that we are giving you anyway, that. I'll do that for you. Thank you. You're welcome. You can have them melted down for some purpose, <laughs> <I'm> sure. <laughs> Thank you all for your service. Any words? Thank you. You're welcome. I, I have a few thank yous of my own. <laughs> if I may. Um, Uh, so this, this uh, pardon me, this, this work has been very meaningful for me. And um, education is, is supremely rewarding work, and it's been an honor to serve. Uh, and I appreciate the kind words. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I especially want to thank some of the people who have made this work particularly <clears throat> meaningful. And I'm, I'm going to do this in reverse order to pull myself together. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to start with my fellow board members, Joe, Kate, Susanna, Barbara, Michael, and David, for your consistently selfless service. Your integrity and commitment are an inspiration, and I will, be, I will miss working with each and every one of you. Uh, I also want to um, thank Michael Moore, uh, Frank Governelli, and Jim Walsh, the town councilors, for putting in place a 10-year plan 
for the financial management of our school facilities. This will, this will pull me right together. <laughs> <laughs> Clar clarity on long-term financial issues makes a lot of other things possible. So thank you for the hard work that was done there. Um, I want to thank CAPE teachers. Uh, whose endless hours of preparation, classroom attention, and above and beyond student support are the secret to our success. Thank you for everyone who teaches. Um, I want to thank Meredith Nato for, for having the highest of expectations for each of us, students, teachers, and board members alike, and always believing that there is more we can accomplish together with hard work and a positive attitude. Um, and I'd also like to, to speak uh, to Elizabeth Seifries and John Voltz and Heather Altenberg, our incoming school board members who are here tonight. Um, as we leave the board, there's two facts about our schools that resonate most forcefully for me. Um, and this is an encouraging, tonight's board meeting is an encouraging meeting on both fronts. But first, Students who bring a structural disadvantage, either poverty or a disability, to Cape Elizabeth schools um, perform no better here than, they, than their peers do at the average school in Maine. Perform no better here than this, their peers do at the average school in Maine. This is true despite our resources and our standing as a top performing district. So I urge you, please, to continue to support programs that will help close this achievement gap particularly the Open Doors Summer Studio and expanded uh, free preschool. Um, research shows that districts like ours can accomplish this goal with the right focus. Secondly, and again on this issue, there was a lot of encouraging information tonight, but in a survey last spring, 58% of our students report that they are not engaged in their work. As a top performing school district, imagine what would be possible if all of our students found their work meaningful and rewarding. Casco Bay High School principal Derek Pierce said the other night, citing Bill Gates, that the key to student engagement is rigor, relevance, and relationships. We all need meaningful work, even students. Please support opportunities to increase the relevance of the work our students are asked to do. Programs that increase student engagement can take many forms, as, as we saw here tonight but frequently allow for student interest to guide the learning experience. Often, collaboration and hands-on work play a role. Frequently, the outcomes include students who are better prepared for college and work in the 21st century. For examples in our own district, and I added to my list tonight, see the Extended Learning Opportunities Program and Student-Driven Learning, see CAPE Robotics, see the CAPE Hub proposal for the Spurwing Building, and the maker space at the middle school. Opportunities for transformative improvement are not easy to find nor execute. Success will requ require the courage to take some risks. The innovative teachers, students, and administrators willing to make this effort will need your support. Thank you for your service. There is exciting work ahead of you. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to say, well, thank you, everyone. But um, I was thinking about it. I came in as a, um, a parent, and I came in with passion, thinking about uh, early identification and reading, and how if we had everyone identified in kindergarten, first grade with reading issues, you know, how much easier school and life would be, so that they could get to um, not have any stumbles over finding their passion and being able to do whatever they wanted to do. And I realized being a school board member, um, as a parent, I only could see um, my own children and the children around me. And, e and then as a teacher, um, I'm, a, I, I'm a special ed teacher from the Spurwing School, and in that role I had, I could only really see, advocate for my students, my fellow <coughs> teachers. So in CAPE, I appreciate all the teachers who stand up and fight for their classrooms and fight for, you know, class size and their needs, what they, they want in the classroom. Okay, so then as a townsperson, um, you know, we're a two-family, um, you know, we, we make a salary in the, 
we, you know, the salary's tough, you know, and paying the taxes, um, there's not much extra. So I understand uh, the town council's piece on keeping taxes low and the budget issues that we always have. Um, being a school board member, we get to see everything from, you know, I've had six years to study what's happening in state and federal um, education policy and what's happening and all the frustrations that come down that affect teachers and affect, affect school districts and how it's changed. Um, this work is, it's very isolating work. We don't, as school board members, get to talk to each other. Um, we can have one-on-ones. John's usually at the coffee shop around two o'clock, one, two o'clock each days to make sure that um, if anybody wants to talk to him, he's there. We try to make time for people, um, but the work is alone work. Um, so wrapping it all up, what I want to say is, it's a privilege to work as a school board member. You get to see, be as parent, you get to, of course, think of children. Um, I know it's not coming together, but Michael gets me. We all. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, but really, the work here that we do is amazing. Meredith always comes back to what's the right decision for children. And so we get uh, the students on the, on the school board and the rest of us. We get to think as parents, as teachers, because we, we can't always talk about it, but we, we get teachers. We get what teachers going, are going through and what staff. And I think, I like to have somebody called, it's not um, staff, but professionals. Who termed that? Was it, it might have been you, Natalie. Um, was it professionals? Um, colleague, I th you didn't turn it just as staff, but as... Um, when you talked about the Cape oh. characters of Cape, yes. you get to see everyone in the community oh. and you feel closer to them. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's that piece. Colleagues, yeah, that piece. And we, what we really are is we're looking at, school board members get to look at everything. We get to take off our hats as parents and put on our hats of what's good for the K-12 district, which really is preschool to 20. Is it 21 now or 20? 20. 20. I mean, that's a huge range of kids that we are taking care of. And it's a huge responsibility. And the citizens um, let us do that and have let us do that for six years. And we take the work very seriously. It's very emotional work. David might not be talking because he's so uh, verklempt and having um, so many feelings about it, but the work is passionate, and you guys have let us do that. It hasn't always been graceful. Um, it hasn't always been easy, but the, um, I really want to, I, I encourage anyone to come to school board meetings and, okay, the one last thing I'm gonna say, um, is the communication protocol. When you're a parent and you don't agree with something, please tell your teacher. And CC the, the administrator and let the teacher and the administrator have a conversation about it. If you don't like what's happening with the teacher and the administrator, please send another email, have another face-to-face -face conversation, and then get the superintendent involved. If you don't like what's happening, then come to the school board so that we can see how the administrator, the teacher's handling it, the administrator's handling it, and the, our superintendent's handling it. Because that's the only way the district can move forward and identify pockets. When we don't do all those steps, we're missing pieces and we're spending a lot of time on negative conversations rather than positive conversations. And that's what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your service, Kate. Yeah, I do have a few things. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I really don't have much. I didn't prepare anything. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> but I would like to thank the existing board members, uh, Barbara, Michael, um, the one who's getting off with me, and, and the rest. Um, it's, 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 I've learned something from everybody. Um, 
there's always something to learn on the school board. Somebody always has something to bring. Um, people have skills that I don't have. They, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been intellectually challenging with my fellow members, uh, with the public, with teachers, with uh, the administration. It's been a lot of fun. Looking back, when we first got on the board, we were fighting with the state. We were constantly getting cuts mid-year. It was really, really challenging. We had uh, even more than we've had recently fights with town council uh, about funding. It, we're in a much better place now. We have, uh, a, uh, I think, in spite of this last year, we have a, a good relationship with the town, a good relationship with town council, a good relationship with the community. Um, we also evolved from, I think we're on our third superintendent in six years. Uh, and I honestly want to, I agree with everything John said, and I'll, I'll do a lawyerism. I'll, I incorporate everything he said by reference, which means everything he said I take credit for. Um, I do want to thank Meredith. It's, it's, um, we've had some good superintendents, um, but I will frankly say that it, it's been an extreme pleasure to deal with you. It, it truly has. Um, not the least of which, every time I'd raise a legal issue, she would cut me off before I finished, raise the issue, give me the answer, and tell me what I should do. It's pretty unusual. That's called the anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually listen, but it's, um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I think the three new members are going to have some challenges. Um, I think you're very well prepared. Um, we've, I've seen a bunch of you at uh, various, you know, obviously know Elizabeth from prior years. I think, I think we're leaving in good hands. Um, I also want to thank Jeff Shedd, who I've dealt with over the years uh, with my son's school system. And with him, he was on mock trial with me years ago, teaching mock trial. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've made a lot of friends, and I, I think we've done a lot, not the least of which I've taught members of the board how to actually make a proper motion. I'm still not sure you've learned, but what the heck. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much, and thank the public and the teachers and the administrators, it's really been a lot of fun. Thank you for your service, David, John, and Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Item five. So in your packet is the first uh, public draft of the 2016-2017 calendar. As a reminder, we are required by statute to have our calendar aligned with the other PATH sending districts. PATH is a Portland Area Technical High School. There are seven sending districts to the Portland Area Technical High School, including um, Portland schools. All of our calendars must align so that there are no more than five days across our seven districts that are not in common. As you can imagine, with every district having its unique um, preferences for um, start uh, prior to Labor Day, after Labor Day, finishing as quickly as possible, scheduling professional development around certain weekends or other activities, fitting in conference times, it is a very difficult task to try to put together a calendar that that accommodates the preferences of those other districts as, and meets the law. So this is our best attempt uh, across the seven districts to do that. Um, there are 175 instructional days in our school calendar. The city of Portland has 180 instructional days, so wow. those five days don't count towards the common days for the state, but those slight variations in each district's calendar make this task even more complex. Um, <laughs> this calendar is in compliance, and this is representative of the other um, district's calendars, but this, this calendar is in compliance, as presented, is in compliance with the other districts and the statute. So, um, notable changes for us. Pond Cove, as you know, um, has had five, well, they haven't had them all yet. They've had three of five um, early release days at the K-4 level only this year. Um, staff feedback about those days has been very positive, and Pond Cove has requested that we incorporate seven of those into next year's calendar, so that is shown in this draft that's before you. This year, the high school also had 11 professional Mondays. Those, well, unless I'm looking at the wrong draft, I believe those were reduced in the draft. Um, so at the district-wide, we have six professional Mondays, and we have an addition, 
additional common um, professional development day at the beginning of the calendar year. So those are really the significant changes. School is started, is slated to start after Labor Day. I know that's always a, a big question. It is slated to begin on September 6th. Okay. Um, how are we doing on surveys, feedback about the changes from last year for Pond Cove? Uh, in terms of the early release days, yes. I'm not aware that we have surveyed parents at this time with respect to that. I know that we've asked staff about their preliminary feedback. So that's certainly something we could do. Um, Kate, you bring up a good point. I do know that the board did receive communication from one Punko parent who expressed um, some, uh, some frustration with the lack of being able to tap into babysitters for if it's only a Punko half day, how do they tap into older siblings or, or neighborhood babysitters if they're still in class? Um, with five days and only at two of them at the point that we had received that email. She had just realized there was the third one coming up. Um, I'm wondering how a calendar with seven days may add to the, that feeling of angst for punk of parents. Um, John? John? Well, I, I don't know what it would do <laughs> for babysitters, but I, I think my response to that would be to, to make sure that parents understand what the purpose of a early release day is in terms of teacher professional development. I think if it's viewed, you know, principally in the context of ch child care, um, we're not going to come out very well. But, but if we can view this in the context of the greater educational purpose, um, you know, people may be more sympathetic to what we're trying to do with these professional days. So I would just encourage a lot of good communication with parents at the elementary level around what, what the purpose of the days are. I, um, I also would appreciate a, a survey. And I'm also trying to remember, is, do we have an all school option on early release days for community service um, sponsored activities? They have activities available. Um, according to the community services director, the families that have taken advantage of that are largely families who already participated in the extended care program. Okay, but there is an option for some support should a babysitter not be available. And, and then I think the other side of that, because I, I appreciate the tension, as John said, between childcare issues and families with both people working and so forth, and the, and the need to give teachers time to work together. And Kelly, I guess what I would ask of you maybe um, at the next meeting, because we're not voting today on this. Yes. I, going through and doing a quick count, and as in just my experience as a teacher, that the interrupted week always feels interrupted. And, and with the additional two days, there are 38 weeks or so in this calendar, and 20 of the weeks are interrupted. So, I'd really like to hear from your staff how that half day has impacted the schedule, what that feels like to start a week with a half day Monday, and to have um, more than half of your weeks not be a complete five day week. I just would really like to hear feedback. Perhaps it's been a non-issue. I just knew as a teacher it was, it used to be. I, I loved having the time, but it, it sort of threw the, the equilibrium of the class off. So it's a balance. And I know it is, but just a little more from you, from your staff, and so forth would be really helpful. So Barbara, I, I would encourage um, the, the question being geared towards um, Meredith and having Meredith and Kelly sort of work through yes. that. Thank you. So just as a note, I would not be asking for adoption, calendar adoption in January, just because it's so close to the holidays now, and to give time uh, to answer some of those questions, I would think February would be a more appropriate time. And sort of in the context yeah. of asking for even more days, I guess is what I was looking at. Absolutely. Yeah. Understood. I think that's a, those are great questions. Any other questions or comments on the calendar? Okay, thank you. Item 6F, 5F, Superintendent's report. Okay, I'm going to try not to hit things that we've already talked about. I'm not touching it. 
10 to 9. Sorry. Uh, last week, 120-ish people um, turned out for the screening of Beyond Measure. It was a mix of faculty, community members, administrators, um, folks from other communities as well. It was a, I think, well, the film itself was well received and the conversation afterwards, I think, was very rich. Um, you know, one, one comment that resonated with me in particular was uh, a parent and some of the students in the Student Driven Learning Program were there as well, and as were some of their families who spoke about um, their children's experiences. Um, but one parent comment that resonated with me was really, I want my child to be happy, I want my child to love learning, I want my child to enjoy coming to school, and that, that is at the heart of learning. That's what, that's what we should be focused on, and how do, I, how do I help people hear that? I don't want my child to be coming home stressed, I don't want my child to be you know, miserable and not um, joyful in the way that Susanna described you know, her daughter tonight with respect to the Egypt unit. We want more of that in our kids. Parents want that. Teachers want that. Um, board members want that. But in order to do that, we have to be willing to let go of some of the things we've always done in schools. And there's plenty of research that says doing things differently, deeper inquiry, project-based, problem-based, as you heard um, the students describe tonight, yields good results. It doesn't mean your children are less likely to get into a great college. The research says they're going to do just as well on those standardized tests. They don't necessarily have to take the AP course to do great on an AP exam. Deep inquiry, creative problem solving, communication, collaboration with their peers, those skills are going to enrich their lives and help them um, achieve those things that they want to do in their lives. And you heard some great examples of real passionate interests that our students have. We need, as a community, to continue the conversation and to support our teachers in taking the risk to do things a little differently that, that may not look like two hours of homework from you know, a, a textbook that it may be familiar to us, but may not be as deeply engaging, um, to your point, John, as, as, as a project, a problem-based unit might be. Um, you know, we need to support our teachers in making some of these shifts because it, it's different. We don't know what the outcome's going to be for some of these pieces. You know, this helicopter, if he were actually building it, might crash. It might not get off the ground. You know, metaphorically, that's okay. You know, there's a whole lot of learning as, you know, the statements that you read out loud from those students describes. And, and so, you know, I would encourage parents at home, students who are you know, engaged in these experiences who are, who, or who are not feeling engaged to speak up and have a dialogue about that. Because unless we're willing to do that, unless we're willing to have the conversation, we're not going to move beyond doing things the way we've always done them in schools. Um, so that's my, that was my five minutes probably already. Okay, <laughs> um, our special ed director um, search will be up and running, so I'll be inviting those folks who participated last year, giving them sort of a first shot at continuing in that work and then opening that process up. I, my goal is to have a screening committee meeting um, before the December break, so um, stay tuned for that information um, and hopefully to schedule dates for interviews so that those would happen early in 2016. CIF awarded several grants. You heard one described in the work that John Holdridge is doing with Elizabeth Johnston at the middle school in terms of a publishing house. Um, Ted Jordan at the high school also received a grant for some work he's doing around history of music. There, um, another grant was awarded for blenders in our school cafeterias to be able to provide smoothies um, to students as another lunch option and a healthy option. So thank you to CIF for their work and their um, partnership with the district. We, uh, Ruth Ellen and Jeff attended um, a STEM summit um, that included schools from around the area at Southern Maine Community College and SMCC is looking for ways to collaborate with school districts and schools in supporting their work in science, technology, engineering, and math. So we look forward to continued conversations with them. As Jeff described, there's already work that preceded that summit um, ongoing to try to create dual enrollment opportunities, but 
Other ideas that were exchanged include SMCC staff coming to visit our classrooms and lead instruction, some co-teaching options potentially in a, in a summer format available to students. So it will be exciting to kind of follow that conversation. Members of the innovation team um, visited Texas Instruments in sometime in November, kind of a blur. <coughs> um, and the team that toured folks around consisted of a mechanical engineer, a facilities engineer, a chemical engineer, and a finance office person, um, which I think was representative of the kind of interdisciplinary work um, that they do and that, that I think we are preparing students to do as they go out into whatever future they choose to go out into. Um, they gave us not only a, a, a wonderful tour of the facility, but they described in great detail the kinds of problem solving that they engage in as a team on a regular basis. So it's not that all the chemical engineers sit down together to try to figure out how to resolve a particular issue, but this interdisciplinary team of chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, a facilities engineer, someone from the business office might get together to talk about, here's the specific challenge that we're having. They brainstorm, they problem solve, and then they come up with a solution. So it was fun, I think, for folks to kind of see in a different environment how those, those skills that, that we're working on with students as young as kindergarten uh, might translate into a work setting down the line. We have four students and a teacher um, coming to visit us in January, from January 7th through February 12th from the Taxi School in India. So I want to thank Dr. Perez for her work in initiating that exchange. And I will say we, um, we have host homes for two of those five individuals. So we're still looking for host homes for three um, junior females during that time frame. A couple of those students will be um, spending part of that stay in another community, visiting another um, school setting, but these are fluent English speakers, obviously. They are planning to attend college in the United States, and they're looking for a, a sort of typical family experience. So if you or someone you know might be interested in hosting a student, <laughs> um, <laughs> please uh, reach out to me, and, and we'll put you in touch with Dr. Perez to um, continue that conversation. And we'll be, Dr. Perez and I have crafted a draft letter to go home um, through students at the high school as well. The state has announced that measured progress will be the assessment um, this spring for students in grades three through eight in mathematics and English language arts. We don't know precisely what that assessment will look like, and we don't know specifically date windows yet for those assessments. We do know that they are slated to be considerably shorter than the assessments that students participated in last year, about half the time in some cases. Juniors will be taking the SAT, and the school day SAT is scheduled for April 12th. Um, I'm getting a nod, so I think that's the right date. Uh, April 12th, so that again will be the option for all juniors. We'll be communicating more information to families as we receive it, but the opt-out option will continue to be an, uh, available um, under law, and we are hearing you know, right now the House has passed a uh, bill sort of the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, which has um, morphed a bit. Um, the Senate has yet to vote, but essentially the reauthorization includes um, removal of some of the sanctions that, that have been in place um, for the last decade, and it essentially the, it increases some of the flexibility for states. So. We'll see how that all shakes out and again, you know, how that will translate into um, local decisions and practice. But some good news coming out of that. The Hour of Code, you heard mention of. So another event related to that that will be coming up. You heard about some of the things already going on in our schools and that is across elementary, middle, and high school. But on December 22nd, Pond Cove will hold its second annual Coder Express evening at 6 p.m. in the uh, middle school calf. And I don't want to neglect our arts um, educators, but um, tonight was the fifth and sixth grade concert. Tomorrow night is the seventh and eighth grade concert. And Thursday night, if you're going for the trifecta, is the high school chorus and band concert. So hope to see you at some of those. That's it. I'm stopping there. OK. As always, a multitude of things <coughs> going on district-wide. Thank you for the updates. Um, okay, so item five is complete.
Um, on to item six, new business. Um, David, is, is there still mock trial? Nope. Ended at 8.30. Okay. And that or means nine. we will barrel through our new business in alphabetical <coughs> order. I was going to offer to reorganize for you if we wanted to. No, the longer I wait for the one I care about, the calmer I'll be. <laughs> okay, moving that to last. So, item 6A. Um, may I have a motion yes. for the boys' tennis team trip? You certainly can. Uh, I move that we approve the boys' tennis trip to Hilton Head, South Carolina, April 15th to the 23rd, 2016. Second. Discussion? This is an annual trip taken every year by the boys' tennis team. Um, I believe you have information in your packet in regards yep. to everyone has equal access to the trip. Um, questions, concerns? All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6B, may I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the Nordic ski trip to Sugarloaf Outdoor Center, Kiribati Valley, Maine, December 29th through the 31st, 2015. Second. Discussion? Yet another annual trip taken by the Nordic team. Everyone does have equal access to participate. All those in favor? Item 6C, may I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the nomination of new personnel for 2015-2016 of Assistant Principal at Pond Cove Elementary of Teresa Curran. Teresa? Teresa Curran. Teresa Curran. <coughs> Exciting. Second. Discussion? I'm happy to say that. Uh, We're all looking at you. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Catching up to my cough drop. Okay. Um, we're excited to bring Teresa forward as a nominee. I she brings a wealth of experience at the elementary level. Um, she is coming to us from the Kennebunk schools. She has not been formally an assistant principal, though she has great training and experience serving in a school that doesn't have one, where she regularly provides administrative support. Um, uh, she was strongly recommended by the committee and um, administrators, and um, it was a pleasure to meet with her. Interesting to note that this is the first administrator that we have hired under the new administrative contract, contract step salary, so we welcome her aboard. Um, I'm excited for the nomination. Do you have any? Oh, I was just wondering if there's a, a projected start date. It is our hope and expectation that she will be starting with us in January when we return from the winter break. Excellent. Questions, comments, concerns? All those in favor? Um, item 6D, may I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the, uh, the, the policy IIB on class size as presented for second read. Second. Second. Discussion? Um, I know that the um, policy committee has been feverishly working on the policy to address concerns that were raised during the budget process last spring in regards to our class size policy. Um, there was concern that the class size policy was um, non-descriptive and didn't offer um, clarity to our school community um, and in putting forth through the policy committee, the policy committee has worked um, by comparing policies from other school districts, you know, and let me know if I've missed any of the steps because you've worked really hard on this, um, comparing policies with the other school districts, um, checking in with the um, Hong Kong um, community in regards to the teachers and the administrators in that community around class size policy. Um, looking at research in regards to recommendations on class sizes as well as sort of our past history. And have I missed any of the other steps? Well, you, I, the policy committee has taken. Well, the, the building of? principals from each each building participate in the policy committee. So we're involved in the development of the of the policy. In fact, the policy, policy committee specifically asked building administrators to 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 take a close look at this at the policy but we, we basically we having reviewed the the 
similar policy at, at other comparable districts. We, we expressed a preference for a range, which we thought um, appropriately um, uh, sort of spelled out how, how, how things work in reality anyway. Um, uh, but then we asked administrators to work within their buildings um, to, um, to help us determine what that range should be. Uh, and our goal, again, was to not to change past practice on, on class sizes, but to um, better describe for people how we would uh, determine class sizes so that um, they, they would understand. Because the previous policy, that, which included <coughs> what we call the guideline number, some people viewed as a floor, some people viewed as a ceiling, other people viewed as the number we, every classroom should be. It was, it was hard to, to get it right for anybody. Um, so that, that's why we took the approach of finding a range, so. Um, Could I add to that? Yes, please. Um, um, we, all, we actually asked all of the administrators. We had the curriculum director. We had the superintendent involved. We asked them to, re to not only speak within the building and, and draw on their own uh, experience, um, but also to research the materials in terms of what's, what does the literature say, what, are, what is best practices, because this essentially is a function of best practices um, and what does the literature say in terms of studies, analytical studies in terms of class size, but we also asked them to craft a policy that they thought was the clearest possible. I think policy um, committee members, um, Barbara, John, and myself, weighed in quite heavily on the actual language and it proceeded over, I think, at least three public, publicly noticed policy committee meetings, multiple school board meetings, this issue was raised and discussed. And if you all remember, during the last budget process, we went at length into the school policy on class size. It was debated there at great length, both what the language meant, what was confusing, what does the literature say, a lot of parents got involved, a lot of teachers got involved. So. I think this is the um, this uh, has evolved at long length over long periods of time. With I will venture at least six public meetings at either the school board or the policy committee, extend extensive research by the administrators as well as individual policy members. Plus, we had the benefit of having a uh, two superintendents, uh, one former superintendent, one existing superintendent, teachers, and so forth. So it's it's clear. It, as a lawyer, you can never make a written document perfectly clear to everybody. All you can do is try to make it as clear as possible to the vast majority of people. And I think we achieved that as well as uh, we got confirmation um, on, based on the literature and studies that ranges was the best thing to do. It was really factor-based uh, in terms of a lot of factors that go into determining class size. No one class size is perfect. I think this is about as good as you're going to get. Um, that's my personal view. And I think it's fully supported by the administrative team as well, that they think this is something. Remember, this goes into the budget process. We have to use this policy in order to structure the budget. And um, I think that, that <coughs> I think we achieved as, as much as you could in terms of all these goals. Clarity, uh, predictability, um, a system that people can work with. And quite frankly, it, it puts the decision on class size where it should be primarily in the, in the administrators um, um, taking a look at specific facts of every class, every classroom, and so forth. So just briefly, I wasn't at the first policy committee meeting where this was discussed, though we had provided some information at the board's request beforehand, um, including some of the sample policies from other districts. We were asked specifically um, to pro for the administrative team to provide feedback prior to the subsequent policy meeting, and we as a team sat collaboratively at administrative team meeting. Administrators were asked to bring forward recommendations. Um, we crafted the policy language that, that was presented to the policy committee collaboratively in that meeting and then at the policy committee meeting, as David points out, um, some changes were made to that to help to clarify um, and strengthen the language. So. Um, in regards to, so the best practices in, in policy building is to do your best level attempts in to solicit feedback from those 
to whom this policy will affect the most. And I'm hearing that between the district leadership team, the superintendent, the policy committee members, um, that there has been an, an extensive amount of effort put out to do as much outreach as possible in order to get the most feedback as possible to make the best policy. I, I don't see that one, that any one answer in this policy is ever going to specifically address um, any one particular families or any one particular classroom's makeup. There's so many aspects and um, I'm sorry, it's getting late in the evening and I'm losing words. Um, so many facets that go into making up a, a classroom. What I love about this policy is that it seems to me to give the flexibility for the administrators and the teachers in those summer months, putting together student personality types, gender makeup, size, um, level of instruction that's necessary empowering our teachers to make the best decisions for our students. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. Yes, and I, I would add too that I'm really pleased that we kept as a high priority the t teacher ratios for the high school. We mm -hmm. talked a lot about how in a lot of ways high school classes will have the most variance just because of the, of the <coughs> schedule. So you could have a math class with 15 kids and one with 22, but your student load overall is what makes or breaks a high school teacher in many ways. And we really stood strongly by the ratios that had been suggested before and reiterated our support of that. So uh, I agree with what John and David said. A lot of thought went into this. I feel really confident that the ranges reflect best practice. I think, as has been said, it puts any anomalies to that squarely with the principal and superintendent where it should be to come back to us should a teacher need to be added are we okay or not and and that's the best a board can do i think do you feel comfortable if there was enough feedback from the system to which needs to implement the policy well especially given that there hadn't been a lot of feedback that anything was broken i think i think that what we're looking at is an attempt to clarify some ranges that made it a little confusing before when there was like a target number so um, I, I think we didn't have hundreds of people showing up because people are, uh, understand that it's a high priority for this district to keep reasonable numbers and we've just codified it even further. Are there any other questions, concerns, or comments? Well, uh, I'll just add, uh, my first comments were mostly around the, the process. Um, I have spoken to a couple of people who, had concern, who have expressed concerns about the policy. They're, uh, I think their concerns. Uh, 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 I think their concerns stem from the the, the, the fact that the, the ranges. Um, they may have viewed the the previous numbers, the, the 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 guideline numbers. They may have viewed those as caps, and so in in in, in kindergarten, uh, in <coughs> grades one and two, um, we have we now have ranges which do treat those other numbers as caps. Um, in other words, the range in kindergarten is 14 to 18. The range in grades one and two is 16 to 20. Um, but in three, three and four, we have a range of 19 to 23, which is um, consistent with past practice. Um, but that number 23 is higher than the number 22. So I think um, that was one of the concerns that people expressed was, you know, does th is this, is this, does this represent increasing class sizes and, and and my answer to that is no it doesn't this is consistent with pa past practice and then uh, the other thing that they that, that people have pointed out is 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 well is some of the language in this policy does it allow for the possibility that a classroom is larger than in, in let's just to stick with three and three grades three and four that a classroom is larger than 23 and yes there is language that um, that is intent in the policy that's intended to address circumstances in which a class may be larger. There are many circumstances that can be imagined. Um, very often uh, class sizes are determined in the budget process which takes place in February and March. Um, but 
uh, oh, I'm sorry, numbers of, so we anticipate class sizes and we determine numbers of teachers to be hired. <laughs> Um, as uh, we saw in the elementary school last September, uh, in September we can have more kids show up at our door than we expected. Um, and when that happens, um, there are a number of different approaches you can take. Um, you, certainly you could hire another teacher and we could tell the second grade class that uh, I know you thought you knew who your teacher was, but you don't know who your teacher is anymore and everybody's going to be shuffled and you don't know who your classmates are. And if, I think if we ask parents and teachers at that time it's in September, do you want us to hire another teacher and divide up all these classrooms and reshuffle everything, we would probably hear that the answer would be no, that people would prefer that their students have the continuity and the, and the, and the um, confidence about who their teacher is and who their classmates are going to be. Um, but there are other circumstances. There may be a child who needs to be in a different classroom because the pace of learning in that classroom is more appropriate for the child. Uh, there may be a child who needs to be in a different classroom because of a peer uh, who's a distraction <coughs> for, for the child in, in the classroom. So under those kinds of circumstances, you may, you may have a classroom that becomes, in, you know, in, in grades three and four, that becomes 24 students. So that's why we have some language and some people who, who wrote to the board identified that that was possible. And, and I would agree with them that that is possible in, in the language and it was intended to make that possible because we anticipated that those things might happen and because um, in my belief class size is one of the components that goes into, um, uh, that goes into student achievement um, but it's not, it's, it, and it may have to do with relationships, but it doesn't have to do with rigor or relevance. So it's not the, it's not the whole, uh, whole picture when it comes to what, what student achievement or outcomes will be. So um, that's what I have to say on the language of the policy. And I would like to sort of piggyback on what you were saying about the dynamics in the classroom, even if they do go beyond the range or there happens to be issues that that surface as the year goes on, um, that one teacher isn't often, is not the only adult in the room. There are other possibilities and other supports in the system. And there are also, many of those students don't sit in that one room all day long in the majority of our district either. So there's, it's a very clear um, um, this is a piece of paper that intelligent <laughs> people um, have worked on. It is, someone's always going to find an issue with it because it's um, a piece of paper with you know, words on it. I think the biggest thing that I found, which I was trying to say earlier, is the trust, it's the relationship we have. Um, if parents are finding their child's classroom, um, classroom isn't meeting their needs, they go to their teacher, and then the teacher goes to the administrator, and the administrative team works on the STP, the student-centered, what is it? Student-centered learning? SST. SST, student. Support team? Exactly, there are students, that that, the student support team. There are, um, there are protocols in place to help kids and to help families who aren't happy with the class size, but we can't change the policy after these great minds have looked at it. And it's been looked at because it comes into a budget. Everybody looks at this policy. So it's the trust factor again, and it's the building relationships between parents and teachers and administrators so that we're solving these problems before they just get an issue with a piece of paper. It's a really, so. We can pass it. I, I can support this piece of paper as long as we all know that this is a relationship building work that we're doing and that if there's issues, we bring them up and we solve them and all kids will be taken care of. <coughs> That's all I have to say. Are there other comments, questions, or concerns? Yeah, I would just like to add, I'll wait till 9.30 to make my comments. <laughs> but uh, now, uh, you know, um, the, the, one, the main feedback I got from the prior policy was it's, it's one number. So I had uh, people who said, you know, the school spends a lot of money. In fact, Michael 
you said at the school board meeting 60 percent of our class size is below the recommended range implying that we have lots of teachers and you know uh, extra teachers and the flip side was well this one class or two classes are above the target you know why why is my child be being treated differently so i think uh i prefer the range um and it is a policy and then no one had to change it it was driven by school board desire and, and feedback to clarify it and i think uh the practical reality will be you know we can say in here th these aren't meant to be the maximum guidelines but just because you make it a range it's still going to be construed as such if you have a class in third grade that's at 25 you're going to hear that that exceeds the high part of the range. So whether it's a single point or range, you know, parents are still going to look at the numbers. Um, I do like the fact that if a class side exceeds a recommended size, there is a specific action step to take. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with the changes. As we've learned, you know, you can change policies. Um, there's no requirement that this has to be the policy for the district five years from now so after we go through a cycle of implementation get feedback maybe there needs to be greater greater clarity we can always uh, further further improve it but um you know i'm comfortable with the changes that have been made and know that parents will always hold the school board accountable and ask how many students are going to be in my class and if it's above the high end of the range you know there, there needs to be a a reason and uh, on, on why that's the case, and um, that ultimately will will be the the test of, of the policy. So, um, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Michael. I I just have to say one other thing because Kate mentioned budget. Um, if this is a budget issue, it's this is we're not talking about the size of the pie here. The, there are opportunity costs to to. You know, class class size is one of the is one of the elements in student success. Um, teacher preparation and training is is um, is another one. That's one I think is very important. Um, so if you ask me, would I fight for for education funding to keep class sizes down? I, I would tell you yes. But if you said, would you rather take your education funding and put it into you know where are you going to put 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 the put your funding? Um, do you want to put it into reducing class size? Do you want to put it into um, training your teachers, you know, th th that's the kind of conversation um, that um, we need to be having around class size. This isn't the decision. We're not making a decision right now about how much, how much is an appropriate amount of money to spend on education. We're, we're, we're talking about how much flexibility do administrators and teachers have to understand and meet student need. All I meant about the budget just to, is to say that it's all in our minds all the time. We're all on the finance committee, and so we all think about these questions um, in every decision we make. We just don't pick it up every two years and say, okay, we have to look at this because it's in the cycle. We look at it because it's important to the districts. Thank you. Okay. Well, before David falls asleep again. I'm not falling asleep. Any more comments or questions? You're just deep in thought, you know. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 6E, may I have a motion? Uh, no motion necessary for this item. This is uh, uh, three policies. Pol this policy committee is bringing forward first, first read. Um, they have to do with uh, child abuse and, and neglect and the changes to the policy are changes that are required by law um, as is often with the case with this type of policy so policies are put forward in in, um, in our packets um, and the, the change in the law is one that that um, that uh, encourages it, uh, individual educators um, to take more responsibility in terms of reporting uh, instances of s suspected mistreatment of students. Thank you. Any questions for the policy committee? Are there any feedbacks or comments? Um, we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait because we're the policy committee members are. Yes. 
you can still forward <coughs> comments or questions to the superintendent. Yes, I'm please. quite certain you will share them. Um, item 6F. May I have a motion? I move that we approve to appoint three representatives to the Community Service Advisory Commission. So I keep going? Yeah, who are you going to appoint? Someone has to <laughs> identify who they are. Have we? We have, you have your color coded and it's throwing me off. So, so I'm sorry, we have multiple applicants um, for the Community Services Advisory Commission. We have three open positions and we received letters of interest from multiple people. Um, they were included in your packet. They are Terry Patterson, Stacy Karp Mosier, David Hillman, Chris Brigham, and Debbie Butterworth. If the board has not had the opportunity to review those, we could hold that appointment until January. Um, there will not be a meeting of the advisory commission in the first week and a half of January, so you do have time for that yeah, adjustment. Look to you guys for. It does make sense since David is on the, <coughs> in the dual role to hold it till January he's off the board. Well, to be honest with you, since there's more people than app, more applicants than positions, I, I'm perfectly happy. I don't even have to apply. Is that a withdrawal? Not yet, but perhaps <laughs> soon. Um, how, do, how, does, yeah. um, how do we feel about perhaps tabling the motion and withdrawing it until January? I, I feel great about that. You do? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> Excellent. <coughs> Thank you very much. All those in favor for that amended motion? Yeah. Motion. Mm -hmm. um, item 6G. I would just say I appreciate the interest. I, I, it's how often incredible. do we have more to choose from than? This is the first, so right. it's very exciting. So, it's the first for exactly. me. I, guess that's I think it's the first for all of us. It's pretty much what's throwing us off here. Um, <laughs> item 6G, a motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement for Cape Elizabeth Educational Administrators Association. Uh, dated July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2007. Second. <laughs> so moved. So, um, discussion. Okay, so um, we're bringing this before you again. Um, since the previous signing and, and approval of the board, um, there has been some um, language clarification that was necessary, especially in regards to the retroactive, retroactive pay for departed administrators um, during the negotiations, which um, after, after talking it through um, both John and I on the negotiation team, we have brought this before the board in an executive session to explain some of the language clarification that was necessary. Um, are there any other questions or comments or concerns? David. So if I understand this correctly, we're approving the one that's included in our packet because this thing's the same date as the previous one. So we're, the motion should be to improve the one in our packet. My understanding also is that uh, um, I guess I, I have, I'm going to express my concern that we can't be in the, pro in the business of renegotiating contracts after they're <laughs> signed. That if there's a, a, an issue, uh, a, the issue about this, if I understand this right, is, is it has to do with retroactive benefits for people who are no longer a member of that bargaining, collective bargaining at the time it's signed. So at the time that we signed the agreement, there were two administrators who had departed our district, and yet um, there was retroactive pay between the time that their previous collective bargaining agreement had expired in June and to the time that we actually signed the agreement. And that amount is, uh, so the question is the previous agreement arguably did not include paying those people, whereas the one that's being proposed tonight would pay, Correct. would propose paying those people. Yes. And how much is that? It's roughly in the ballpark of four thousand dollars. In in the, I, I'll just express my view. I have a real problem with you, you can't, especially a collective bargaining. You can't constantly go back to the table to renegotiate something. On the other hand, if there's a an issue of, um, uh, not a meeting of the minds on a particular issue, and that issue is only a, a four thousand dollar item. 
I, I mean, I'm willing to consider it. And, and my understanding is in this case that it was a good faith uh, differences of the wording of something, um, although one could argue either side, my guess is, with certain vigor. Um, I guess my particular view is if, if what we're proposing is to pay some people that really work for us and did a good job and there is a legitimate dispute, or good faith I'll say, dispute about the language, I'm, I'm willing to support adopt a new one on a small ticket item that's, that has great benefit. It, it, it's to pay people who have worked long and hard, did a good job for us. For the two people that were involved, my understanding is they did. But I, I want to caution the board in the future, we, we cannot get in the, in the position of, I can tell you I have never done a contract where somebody didn't complain later that they didn't know what they were signing, or they didn't understand the language, or they thought it meant this and they thought it meant that. But, when you negotiate a contract, it's a tapestry. Everybody negotiates something at once, and you can't renegotiate it later on. You're changing the entire thing. In this particular case, I would support doing it because of the people involved, the amount, and my understanding is that it is a, a good faith dispute about interpretation of the, of the application of certain language. But I would urge you not to do it in the future, except in the rarest of instances. And I would think that, uh, the other side of anybody we negotiate a contract wouldn't be all that happy with us renegotiating something later on because we didn't understand something. So I think I covered everything. Thank you, David. John? Yes. Yeah, so, so David, I, I absolutely agree with your, with your concern um, uh, in terms of uh, re reopening negotiations. <laughs> negotiations is one of the most difficult things that the school board does. Um, they, can, they can consume uh, months, if not years, of, of time um, to complete, and and so I I, I absolutely hear your caution. Um, what I would want to make clear in this instance is that this is not a this isn't a reopen or a renegotiation. This is a case where both parties agree that the language that we're asking you to adopt tonight, that had this language been put forward in the in the agreement in the original. Um, in, in the original agreement that it would have been agreed to by both sides. Um, so it's not a renegotiation or a reopening of negotiations in that respect. Um, it's, a, it's a mutual agreement that um, the language put forward to the board tonight would have been supported by the, um, both sides of the negotiating teams had it been, um, had it, had it been uh, written at the time. Are there any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor? Fantastic. Thank you. Item 6H. May I have a motion? Uh, um, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Yes, I move that we amend the employment agreement between Superintendent NATO and the Cape Elizabeth School Board uh, as, uh, as envisioned in that agreement by making a change to superintendent's salary and um, uh, equivalent to the change uh, provided for in the administrator's contract collective bargaining agreement for next year um, as well as an additional one week of vacation second second okay <laughs> yep. um, so as we have discussed in executive session with our superintendent um, we have over previous months have been looking at her evaluation and then we reconvened after her very successful evaluation period to look at some comparison salaries and, and walking through as is the board's prerogative of her compensation package that would be in alignment with her performance for the district. Um, it has come to the agreement of the board to bring forth um, a two and a half percent um, salary increase for the for the academic year 2016-2017, which is in alignment with the um, agreement that was has just been negotiated with the administrators, and then to also um, add a, an additional week 
from her to make five weeks for vacation. Um, anyone care to add to that? David. Yeah, I, we're not, I, I want to be clear. Um, I, we, the, the way this motion's worded, that we're amending it, it sounds like we're doing something um, unilaterally to improve something. The reality is we specifically negotiated that to allow us, when we thought it was necessary each year, to adjust uh, Meredith's salary up if we thought it was deserved. So it's not an amendment. All we're simply doing is exercising the contract right Correct. that we already have. So I would classify this as what we're simply doing, we're not amending the contract, we're further uh, supplementing it by changing her salary for the next contract year by increasing the salary by 2.5% and adding a week of vacation. It's not a change, it's not an amendment. We're exercising a duty that we already have and we're doing it based on the evidence and the analysis that we've done. So it's not, we're not as much as I think the world of Meredith, we're not throwing her this windfall. This is something she's earned, and we have the right to do it. I'm really adamantly against amending contracts after the fact, and we're not amending it. Just like the same thing for the collective bargaining agreement. <laughs> so, um, Silver ball. It is my understanding, actually, since the beginning of your tenure, that I don't think you've had a pay raise. Well, you certainly haven't had one have. last year. Yeah. No. Okay. Two. Two. Well, how does the contract read, Joe? Does it read that annually the board will consider the super? Yes. Okay, yes. so annually the board is, so it's not an amendment. You're right, Dave. It's, a, and I it's think exercising that's, that, yeah. that clause within right. the agreement right. with the board that annually the board will review and I think compensation it's, package to be in alignment with her evaluation standards. Yeah, and I, I it's think different from our collective, other collective bargaining mm -hmm. agreements in that it doesn't include a, a pre-negotiated pre uh, right. increase right. of any type. Do we want to um, edit the motion, David? Um, Since we're not amending, we're. Uh, I, I would that we we um, I would uh, modify the motion to say that we. Uh, uh, the, I I hereby move that we uh, supplement the, we exercise the provision in the uh, current employment agreement between uh, Superintendent Meredith NATO and uh, the Cable School Board of Education to exercise this right to adjust her salary for the coming year based on. Uh, the evidence we've received in our analysis to increase her salary for the next year, next contract year, by 2.5 percent, and adding as an additional uh, monetary benefit uh, an extra week of vacation. Sure. Is there a second to David's amended motion? A second motion. I need to stop saying the motion. I can't read that back to you. I'm going to be relying on video tape. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Is there any further discussion? I, set, I accept the amendment to my motion. Excellent. Are we ready for a vote? Yes, we are. OK, all those in favor? It's, Meredith, thank you so much for your leadership. Item 6I. I move that we approve the following athletic staff nominations as listed in the packet under item C I. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All those in favor? Excellent. Moving right along. Coming to the close. Um, committee reports. Well, we heard from the policy committee. And then we have upcoming changes within our policies. That's correct. Wellness is slated to meet uh, next week or the following week. No, if, it has if, to be next week. Yeah. Next Thursday, I believe, afternoon. Subcommittees have been meeting. Exactly. So the last meeting. Five subcommittees have been meeting to wow. get the work done and then they will come together um, to meet as a whole. That's impressive work. It is impressive work, yeah. Thank nice. you for that service. No, it's the wellness that's the district. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I sense that since we're drawing our, our current school board calendar year to a close, there's probably little other community board staff. So moving along, school board agenda item requests. Um, our next school board business meeting will be with our new school board members. So just um, the two items that are currently posted, the swearing in of new school board members occurs on Monday, December 14th at the regularly scheduled town council meeting. And then um, in accordance with the town charter, the board meets in caucus that evening, um, fo immediately following the swearing in. So Monday at 7.15 approximately. And that it is during that caucus meeting that we determine leadership positions for the following year. Fantastic. Okay, I think that covers eight and nine. Anyone care to have a motion for number 10? It's your honor, Kate, please. I move that we adjourn. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your Michael, service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.